All right, welcome everybody to episode eight of Pros and Joes talking friends or foes. Uh, the host Mike, he's gone, he's sick, he's got problems. I think he's intimidated by these boys from Ole Miss. But anyways, nonetheless, the show must go on. You know, Doug Taylor. Before this thing started, y'all were talking golf. Doug, you becoming a golfer? No, nah, man, I'm out of my element when I when I'm on the golf course. But I have gotten a lot better since last time Taylor saw me. I uh... I figured it out a little bit. I can hit the ball decently straight now. So I've gotten a little bit better, but I'm still not good. So is Taylor good? <clears throat> Taylor's, I mean, that, that dude should be on the tour. I'm pretty sure he's scratched, but I'm not, <laughs> no. not entirely sure. No. So Taylor, no. you got a backup career in case this baseball thing don't work out. You're just going to hit the team. Possibly. Maybe the, maybe the Champions Tour or something once I hit 50, you know, maybe. I could really <laughs> practice. You know, we were just talking last episode, uh, you know, about dual sports and being able to to accomplish that, you know, I wonder if you could play golf and pro baseball at the same time. Hmm. No, be the, be the mean, first one, Taylor. Play, right, but definitely would love to play in some pro am tournaments or something like that. Uh, see a lot of like Josh Allen right now is playing in the pro am instead of playing in the um, Pro Bowl, I believe. <laughs> I mean, that's ultimate bragging rights. Man. So I mean. You know, I've seen Mahomes go play in some of those programs. I would like to but, do that. But see, you know? but see, you're naming football players. You'd be the baseball guy, dude. You'd be the one coming in there. Right, I've seen right. Steph Curry do it basketball, but I ain't some... seen a baseball player. Right. Well, I feel like a lot of the times that it's happening, it's football's off season and then baseball's in season while golf's going on. So that's why the football players have more of an opportunity to play in these programs. So. Makes you know, well, barring whatever, maybe a couple fall tournaments there might be that you could play in. Well, I'm never going to come golf with you because Doug will be even way better than me. Um, I can't <laughs> keep it straight, like he said. So, um, you won't, you we won't catch me. We could be a scramble team. That's what we could do. Yeah. If, my can, shot if, get, if we put out. ourselves together, maybe we can figure something out, though. I uh, I sponsor a team for uh, a charity that we do, uh, Healing Hearts. It's a nonprofit. I sponsor a team every year. And every year, the the people who run it say, are you ever going to play? Because they'll give me a golf cart and just let me drive around and watch, watch my team. And I was like, no, never. I was like, I'm not even good enough to be the worst on the four. I, I, like, it's just that bad. So, <laughs> But, you know, getting into baseball things, man, it's been a long time since we had both y'all on and off the bench. And, you know, we were talking to you guys when you were at Ole Miss. And so, Doug, a lot's happened since then. You know, you were drafted by the Guardians with the 58th pick. Um, talk to us about draft day, what that process was like, who was with you, you know, the emotions, all that stuff. Uh, I uh, I was back home. I had every, all my family with me, and I was um, – the the way that it worked out that year was there was the first round was the day before. So I watched that, not really expecting to get drafted, and then there was two through five the next day. So we were pretty geared up that day, and then – um you know you're sitting around a long time and it's a lot of I mean you have a lot of pressure on you but you can't do anything about it a lot of people just like looking at you waiting for your phone to ring so but eventually happens phone rings you answer you say yes and then it's just you know so it's like an overwhelming emotion just with your entire family and it was just one of one of those days I'll cherish and remember for the rest of my life it's your childhood dream right you want to you want to play baseball yeah, I mean, my mom's got, like, a stack of, like, 10 hats. She was like, these are the 10 teams you said, right? And I'm like, yeah, and she's got, like, 10 hats stacked in her room waiting for the one team, and then that was it. So it it's, was awesome. It's, all, it's like one of those things it feels like it takes forever to get to, and then it happens so fast, you know? So and, Taylor, yeah, you know, boom. So, Taylor, let me ask you, uh, you know, obviously you got drafted in the sixth round, but before we get to that, like, with you being tight with, you know, Doug and Gunner and those guys – like just how excited do you get to see your teammates as, as they come off the board early? Absolutely. And even, you know, even with some guys, I even think back to some guys the year before, which Doug can probably attest to, is when COVID happened and there was only five rounds that year. Um, that just, was, scary. you know, as, a lot of right, as crazy as it all was, you know, you're home with your family because of the pandemic. But then seeing these guys, you know, get the opportunity in the top five rounds, to you know to go live out their dream was really cool but also in our in our draft seeing gunner and and doug go so early you know uh, one you just obviously reaching out to him and just you know telling him you know congrats and 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 so on but it's something that we all talked about while i don't miss as well you know and then getting to see us essentially do it together and in the same draft is a really cool experience 
you know, and so for you, when you get drafted six round, is it the same thing as Doug? Are you back home with the family? Where are you at? Right. So I went back home, I believe I might have been in Oxford working out a little bit before because of how the timing was. But then I, I you know, ultimately ended up making the trek back home and just it like literally just was me, my mom, my dad and my my younger brother. And we just sat in front of the TV and watched all, watched all the picks. I, like Doug said, I don't, didn't watch the you know first few rounds, just knowing where where my positioning was. Um, but. I think we might have just made some dinner or no, it was during the day that day. So we made some lunch or got some lunch and just sat down and, and waited and, you know, got a few calls that morning. Wasn't yeah, really it was sure. Early. It's kind of a question mark. Right. Yeah. That first one was early. I, I remember waking up and like kind of waking up late because it was the off season. I wasn't like working out super early, waking up late and then already getting calls from my agent like hey man we're already this is what we're looking at for day two blah 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 and it was it started out really early and like yeah. eating breakfast I, or something like that and then you're starting to get calls i remember being in bed and having a few texts from guys just saying like you know we, we're, we're looking at you today you know you know kind of mm -hmm. all the logistics um ultimately finally got the call and white Sox called me and agreed and got to see my name pop up on the on, on the tv and um you know, just getting to hug my, my family and, you know, it's a lot long, you know, not, a, I, w I don't want to say long, but a lot of years and a lot of hard work that finally, you know, were able to pay off. Yeah, absolutely. We, we talk about it, you know, we had both y'all on for your stories and not, not to knock Doug because, you know, recruited in eighth grade and all to Ole Miss, but Taylor, we talked to you about your story and obviously you thought about hanging up the cleats and didn't you say you were already at Texas state, like already just, thinking academics that's and, correct i mean look at you getting drafted in the sixth round it's just a wild ride man but it's a testament it to your been. hard work too absolutely mm -hmm. but i wouldn't be here with a lot of the people that pushed me and also helped me you know being as my family and and coaches you know working up all through these all through the levels that i've been through i don't know about you taylor but whenever i think about that stuff it's like a lot of times that people people around me push me to do things that end up we end up getting credit for it but most of the time I usually don't have the drive internally I wish I did but like I've always just been blessed with good people around me that have been able to get me to the next stepping stone to get me going otherwise man I I think it's innate human nature to just take the easy way and then you don't end up doing what you need to do to get where you're at well I mean you're 100 percent correct like I'm sorry to cut you off but my dad was the one that got me to go to this camp because I was already done with baseball basically and wanted to go to Texas state and told me to go to this TCS post-grad camp. And that's ultimately what got me to continue playing baseball. Well, yeah, because both what I was going to say is because both of you guys are Christian guys, you know, Proverbs 27, 17, iron sharpens iron there. I mean, there's no fitting thing. It, it's, it's always somebody helping mold somebody. It's usually not somebody doing it on their own. And it's, it's those who push you to the next level. And so speaking of pushing to the next level, I'll start with you, Doug, you know, when you first get there, man, like what are the adjustments you have to make immediately um, coming from a college program to being in a minor league system? Uh, it kind of even feeds off what we were just talking about. Like you kind of become your own hype, man. You don't have that same like young kind of camaraderie that you have in college where it's like we're gonna they're gonna have your strength coach put you through hell doing the Omaha challenge every year and you're gonna bond with those guys and you're gonna get tight and you're gonna really want to work towards your goal then they put out goals for you too you don't have to come up with your own uh immediately like right when I got drafted it became like all right I gotta I gotta have a little bit more internal drive on my own and I also gotta like you know find people find the right people around me because you can't just buddy buddy up with everybody you know you got to find really good people within the organization that you trust to you know push you and uh you know they push you and you push them be a good teammate and all that stuff so I thought that was just a big difference compared to in college it was a little bit it, it was just a different feel I don't know maybe Taylor can explain that well, yeah no I, I think it's exactly what you said though because the the camaraderie thing the reality is you're competing with these guys to be the next man called up. Right. So like, while you may be friends, it's actually now a competition, whereas you're not working together like you are at, or on that college team. And so mm -hmm. um, it's kind of a fine line. Right. And so, yeah, Taylor, for you, man, was it the same thing? Absolutely. And I think it, another way to put it, it definitely becomes a little more individualized. Um, it's more, you know, more so is you know, a lot, a lot you think on like, 
now the off season, there's a lot, you know, you have a lot of time to where you could really just not do anything. And it's going to be more so you're only going to go as far as you allow yourself to go and what you put into it and, and, you know, investing in your career to, to be able to get in return, you know, hopefully get paid one day or, you know, make it to the big leagues. And, uh, you know, I think that's a simple way to put it. Obviously the talent's going to steadily increase and go up, but, you know, you just, you know, you hopefully prepare yourself and, and, and do what needs to be done in order to make those, you know, that kind of, um, I guess, learning curve be a little less. And uh, as you go up these levels. Yeah, no doubt. So, Doug, you know, you were last pitching with the Akron Rubber Ducks, which, man, you got to love minor league mascots. Uh, I, they're all amazing. <laughs> but, you know, yeah. uh, how's it been going for you, man? You know, talk to me about what's been going well, and then talk to me about, like, what, you know, you need to improve on early uh, in your, you know, pro career. Um. Well, the first season was kind of – it was kind of a blur. It went by real quick. But I started in the high and then – um pitched well pitched well enough to get out of there and finish the year somewhere else but I mean the most glaring thing is I just got to be able to like you know stay in the zone better I know a lot of the, my first full season I took most of it in stride but I mean a lot of it it was hard for me I, and I ran into the same problems in college but just a little bit less of me having to call my own game and then falling behind hitters because I'm trying to be a little bit too aggressive too advantageous of spin and breaking balls early and not just like attacking guys so I mean that's my first big challenge is just like the way I, I approach a start and now it becomes my game and not like our game as coach B would put it. it's not coach B would put it in a way where it's like okay that's not your pitch that's not your strikeout that's our strikeout now it really becomes like you're calling the pitches you can shake whenever the heck you want so I mean I gotta figure out how I want to run my game I guess yeah, because I got so, the tools. I just got to, you know, figure out how I want to run my game. Right, and one of the best questions we ask, you know, as you're talking about the tools and you got to learn, you know, um, what are some names of some some people, whether it's players or coaches, that have, uh, you know, gave you some good advice or been able to help you develop? You know, that same thing we were just kind of talking about. Even though it's you know a little bit of a competitive thing, there's got to be some guys that you know you've been able to pick their brain and kind of and find some things out to help you. Yeah, uh, my high pitching coach, Caleb Longshore, has been phenomenal. He just, like, helped me kind of establish how I want to attack a game, how I want to go the first time through the lineup, second, third, all that stuff. Joel Mangrum, our uh, pitching coordinator for the entire uh, farm system, is phenomenal. He's also just a good – he's, like, a second father figure to me. He, like, brings me back in when I'm getting too aggressive and you know how I can be on the mound. You know, he wants me – to have a little bit more composure so he'll ring he'll ring me back in for that stuff and then uh you know lots of great players like mason hickman who played at vanderbilt he's a phenomenal teammate and great guy to pick his brain about he's been he got drafted in 2020 so he's been around just a little bit longer than us and then uh tanner Bybee, phenomenal teammate as well and he pitched at cal state fullerton and just had an unbelievable year this year i mean just shot up everyone's boards and it's cool to listen to him and how he kind of goes about his day because he obviously has a really good plan as well. Yeah, absolutely. And so, Taylor, man, same thing for you, you know, um, going into your situation. Um, obviously, I remember speaking to you. You were you were pitching in the Arizona League, you know, already getting yourself right, acclimated, throwing the ball. Um, talk to me about – obviously, we know uh, we're going to talk about the transition from organization to organization, but just give it – you know, how, how did you start? How did you feel about the way you were pitching? Yeah, I mean, it was definitely a bit of a crazy year that I that I endured. But I started in high and went to Salem, and then I believe only was there for maybe a week or two, and luckily got you know promoted to Double A, which was in Birmingham. Um, really, kind of was nice back back in kind of the you know the South and and where where I had been for the past three or four years being at Ole Miss. But um, yeah, the year went good. I think more so one thing I could work on is, is not necessarily, I've never had the issue of, of really walking people or struggling with command, but I think now it's getting more into the commanding the ball in the right spots Mm -hmm. and, you know, working on figuring out how to miss more barrels and, and not necessarily just throwing it over the white, but figuring out, you know, commanding in the zone, 
effectively is more so mm-hmm. i guess how you how you could put it and yeah and I figuring say, out I say the same thing too it's right, not right. It, it's the same thing in college like i could throw a strike when i need to throw a strike but that just isn't cutting it in double a like you'll still get absolutely one cookie absolutely and uh you know i mean but also at the same time had a very successful year gave up you know struck out a lot of people gave up a lot of hits didn't walk anybody. So now it's just figuring out. I've got the stuff, obviously, that can strike people out. Now it's figuring out what am I going to do and how, you know. And, and I think as I as the year went on, I started learning. And that, that, like, that learning curve, I started figuring out. But it's just, you know, how can I now be able to do that at the next level and it happen quicker? How can I go to AAA or go to the big leagues and it not take two weeks for me to – get acclimated and, and, and figure those, you know, figure out how to essentially be successful because my first couple of weeks in double a, I struggled, but you know, when I get, you know, when hopefully I, I one day get called up to triple a or get called to the big leagues, I don't need those two weeks to be, to be a struggle. I need to perform right away. And so that's just part of, you know, this, like I said, back to what my last explanation was, is, you know, putting in what, you know, whatever you put in for yourself to be successful and, shorten that learning curve i think is the biggest thing yeah absolutely the question i got for you you know being that you went to birmingham like did, were, were you big on like obviously the michael jordan story you know and his story coming up and he played at birmingham and all that so like and if so was that like kind of cool that you were playing for the same team it was because i believe it might be around the pandemic or so in 2020 when the la- when what is it called the last dance came out right um, mm-hmm. and I had, I, we, I think everybody kind of, you know, pretty much watched that. And I'm going to tell you what, out in Birmingham and at Regents Field, they love them some Michael Jordan. Uh, they have probably a, I want to say as tall as the, as, as, you know, that, you know, how they jokingly say you're going to be hanging up in the rafters. Well, he's the whole rafter, basically. <laughs> they have a portrait of him and, um, but it's it's really cool because you you just I think back now to when I was watching that that documentary and kind of you know essentially being in the same position he was at one point and when he tried to pursue a baseball career. Right. That's actually how we started this podcast, boys. We started by doing it was COVID. We had nothing going on, and we started. We did four episodes uh, talking about the last dance. We were breaking down every two episodes, and uh, then we interviewed Jonathan Bolin. I don't know if you're familiar. Um, played for University of Memphis, got drafted by the Royals. Anyway, uh, we had him on and had his story, and we kind of liked the way that went. And so we kind of did another one, another one. Next thing you know, we're trying to grow the game, right? And and do a yeah, absolutely. But it all it all started with the last dance for us. But it's cool. It's cool. Obviously, you had a transition from one organization to the other and i'll say this before we talk about it um you know i talked about when we had elko and them and brandon johnson johnson on um they're more familiar with how the organizations are set up and structured they actually said they felt like you personally were going to a better situation for you and those are guys who'd be more in the know to me um so let me ask you right off the top is that a true statement i believe so yes absolutely i well one i've more so just i've really you know liked what I've seen so far and the interactions and just top to bottom, everything that that has gone on with it within the organization with Boston, with the Boston Red Sox. But also, I mean, for me, once the trade happened, I went over to out or went over, went up Northeast to Portland, Maine, way up there and uh, started pretty much throwing right away. And actually just think for one, I think the change of scenery really helped. Um, love the guys the full, already that were there. Huh? You got, I said you got the full northeastern Boston type. I mean, it's it's Maine, but it's still the same kind of people. I feel like you're getting the same. Absolutely, experience. absolutely. Let me ask and, you this: uh, What I mean, were you there when it was like really cold, or were you out of there by that time? <laughs> well, so I had just gone. I had just came from you know south where in Birmingham, and I think I was in um Montgomery when that trade actually happened and it's uh, scorching hot well I flew into uh New Hampshire which is where the team was playing on the road I flew into New Hampshire that uh Friday or whatever day it was and that first night I didn't have I didn't have any gear or anything really <laughs> because I had just gotten in there they hadn't really you know they hadn't had a chance to really give me anything the team's on the road 
It's like forty five degrees, and I had to borrow uh, the pitching one of the the pitching coach's jacket. He let me borrow a hoodie, and <laughs> I wasn't throwing that night. But I'm, you know, in the the bullpen's out on You're the field. You're in New Hampshire, so freezing cold, yes. and it's like September. And it's not. It, was it September? Or was it still June or like August? It was like September first. I think the. Yeah. I think when I got when I got traded was like literally August thirty first. Ten days the, left the last day. Like right. And yeah, there was two series left basically, and um, I just it was completely different. And but then then Sunday rolls around during the day, and it's like eighty five degrees. So there was beautiful weather up there, and it was awesome. But definitely getting ready coming this April, I'm gonna. But I will say, and I've been telling my parents and other people this, like Oxford definitely prepared me for that weather. Yeah. Maybe I'm it was chilling a little hoopla here, but we start when you start when they start February seventeenth in Oxford. I'm it's a lot. I mean, it's probably going to be pretty cold. Well, and I'm going to tell you guys right now, freezing right now. If you remember me, to, yeah, it's literally frozen. Up. That's what I was fixing to tell you. If you remember, I told both of y'all on your episodes that I had tickets to the college baseball showdown in Arlington. Remember, and I told you I got snowed I mean, in. It, it, it was frozen. Amazing. Yeah, well, it's like that again right now. I don't know if you heard, Doug. My, my kids have been out of school for three days. And I was like, no way. yeah, and so we're only two weeks from that again. And I got tickets to the showdown again this year. Um, Ole Miss obviously isn't in it. But I'm like, man, please don't happen again. Like, I'm trying to go watch six teams and, you know, nine games in three days. It's the, it's the big deal. And so I'm like, please don't freeze over again. But, I'm you know, in, I, go I'm ahead. in Houston, Texas right now. And it's we're, – we're pushing like 30 to – almost high 20s right now but you know it's bipolar because i was in oxford last weekend to watch all the scrimmages and it was 60 degrees and now obviously you know it's like 20 and iced over so i mean you just never know what you're gonna get absolutely i mean but i'm out here in arizona and it's absolutely beautiful so oh i know (laughs) i'm excited i'm i'm leave to go to fort myers soon and i looked at the the um forecast and it's like 65 to 70 every day some sun great golf maybe yeah, absolutely. I will take advantage of that. So you ended with the Portland and Sea Dogs, and we were just talking before the episode. Uh, you two may have a chance to uh, to square off. I, and with that, I got to ask, you know, as we were talking about, um, you know, where you've bounced from place to place, have you been primarily a starter? You've been out of the bullpen, a mix? What, what have you been doing, Taylor? Uh, I've been primarily out of the bullpen. Um, pretty much Is, it, is a starter in the conversation? Uh, I w- no, I wouldn't say so. I And I've been – I've been actually asked about it before. Not that it was really uh, going to be a a thing that would happen. Just was getting, kind of seeing how I would how I was going to answer and what my confidence was. And and me, I just really prefer the bullpen. And and why well, obviously I loved the closer role when I, when I was nobody's at better and, and, getting the last three outs of the game than Taylor Broadway. <laughs> I don't know why. I'm, everyone's got to mess with that. Getting the last three outs is just as hard as getting the. First freaking nine, you know. Well, 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 Doug, I tell you, we were we were scared to death because Taylor was scheduled to come on. Uh, he was the episode right after Arizona, and so he's going to go do that start. And we're like, man, like we want Taylor to get his first win as a starter as opposed to the closer. But we're like, man, hopefully it doesn't go sideways. And so obviously it didn't go the way he wanted to. And we had to we had to talk to him about it. But yeah, Taylor t- told us told us that day he's a lot more comfortable closing down games which uh, you know i don't Absolutely. think uh, i don't think anybody's gonna be taking your saves uh record anytime soon i don't uh, you know old miss has got some great pitching arms but they don't got no stud closer right now well you know i i hope one day that somebody does because you know that i think that you know that could mean a really good season for old miss again and, and possibly another national championship and i'd love to see that yeah, absolutely. I uh, the reason I had asked though, man, is thinking about the the possibility of possibly y'all being the two starters on opposite teams. You want to talk about a draw and find a way to get Ole Miss fans? They'll be like, "How do we tune in? Do we need to fly out? Like, where we got to go?" Like, that would be cool. That would I've be- actually seen what a lot be? of pictures uh, uh, in the in the Swayze Crazies page of a lot of fans who have went and watched y'all play in different places. So that's pretty cool. I yeah, well, get- man. Uh, gosh, I wish I remembered his name. He was the man. He uh, he saw me in Akron. He came to my only one home start in Akron, but it was the last. The I think it was the second to last game of the season. He came, to see me, and he was the man. I can't. I wish I would remember. Yeah, there's name. a there's a lady that I'm friends with named Vicky White who's got a picture of both y'all. She went and saw both y'all play in different places. 
And so uh, you got to love when when fan bases are loyal and will come watch you, not even just when you play for the college team that they love, but afterwards because they've they've grown that connection and, and loving y'all. You it's, know, obviously, like Taylor, we yeah. talked about you got the you got the Sage record. Doug had a day named after him. I mean, it, <laughs> it's definitely a cool feeling just to know like you've 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 won, you've you know made an impact on on people and, and you know and also just the community of, of of Ole Miss fans and Oxford in general they just continue to support you no matter you know where you go and 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 the, how you know where you go in the future I mean I can't tell you how many times during the year that just somebody would yell hotty toddy to me or while I was sitting in the bullpen and I'll be honest I mean I not a lot of my other teammates and stuff went to big schools and you don't see many greetings like that happening to them. And that just goes to show the, you know, the true just like community and, and, and family that Ole Miss is. Absolutely. Well, we've been talking community, family, the friendly stuff, you know, the show's called friends or foes for a reason. We got to get into some tough questions. This is the foes part. So I'm going to put it on you guys a little bit. We'll start with you, Doug, you know, mm-hmm. and, uh, and I was telling you guys about the story with Landon Sims. And so y'all going to get that same question being that y'all pitchers, you know, when you guys make it to the show, not the minors, when you make it on the big stage, Doug, who's the first former teammate you would like to strike out? Mm. I The moment you said it, I was thinking about it before the show started. And I think I had a couple different answers, uh, a couple different ones rolled through my head. But I, had, I think I have to go back to someone that's kind of been my daddy every time I pitched against him. And it might throw you back. It's going to take it back. He wasn't even there from 2021, but Tyler Keenan, I kind of, I want him. I want him on my shelf. Like (laughs) I want him to be the very first one. And I want to look at that baseball and go, yeah, that was Tyler Keenan right there. But he owned me when I was a young buck, my freshman year. And I was told, telling somebody else's story, like legit two days ago, I was like, I'd spin him a slider just three inches off the plate and he'd flick it into the left field bullpen because it would be left on left. Mm-hmm. And if I tried to buzz a fastball up and in, he just hit it into the student section. So I I don't know if I've gotten that guy out too many times. So if I do happen to be facing like the Mariners for whatever reason, uh, I'd love it to be him. Absolutely. So what about you, Taylor? Um, it's just I was thinking about it. You know, pretty deeply, and I, there's just a one guy that keeps continuously to pop into my head, and I think it's truly one of the best hitters that I've not only played with, but also gotten to face in uh, in our inner squads, and that has to be Jacob Gonzalez. Um, <laughs> for one, I think, it's, and, you know, barring anything, I think it's not going to be you're going to face um, him if, if you get <laughs> he'll make it. I there. think. He will he will be in the big leagues, and I'll say that we're here right now. Well, when, um, well, right now when you know the projected draft board as it is, he's he's number three, and so usually guys don't go with the third pick if it was to fall the way it is, and don't expect to go to the top. I just it feels like he, I can't tr- truly I can't remember that I faced him too many times, but I think I really I don't think I ever struck him out. Um but two, it, I it, I probably gave up a barrel to him, and it, he get he barrels a lot of people up. If we're gonna be honest, and it seems like that's all he does. And I mean, you know, he doesn't strike out very much, and that's just my honest. If if we got to there, I would say this is one of the purest hitters I've ever played with, or will hopefully play you know play against in the big leagues, and would be you know like like Doug say, put that put that put that in a case somewhere. I can't remember yeah. which day it was. It was uh which which game it was, but last year at the the series in Swayze, um, it was eight to five, and there was two men on, and Jacob stepped to the plate, and the two old Miss fans in front of me were like, "Man, hopefully he gets walked and we get to Elko." And I was like, "Guys, this is the guy you want up. He loves yeah. this moment." And sure enough, man. Two pitches later, he hits a three-run bomb. And I was like, I looked at them. I was like, man, I told you. I was like, that's the case. I mean, everybody focused on Elko, rightfully so, and Kevin Graham. But Jacob Gonzalez mm-hmm. tee off in a heartbeat. And you're talking about a guy that's just even killed, too. Like, doesn't get too high, doesn't get too low. I mean, just one of the best ball players I, I've played with. I hope he goes this high, and I hope he makes all the money in the world. But it would love it would be – Pretty funny and pretty great for him to slip a little bit just so he goes to, like, San Diego or the L.A. Because I just want to see him in, like, a Dodgers uniform. I want to see the hometown kid (laughs) 
playing shortstop for the Dodgers. Like I, I could just, see him in a Dodgers uniform. It's like fitting. He, he needs to be like Benny the Jet Rodriguez, man. Like <laughs> for well, the and, Dodgers. And you know what I learned? Uh, obviously, we had him on the show, but like seeing him in Oxford, he actually talks a lot. But we had Brooks Lee from Cal Poly on, and he was talking about playing with him at Team USA. And he said, the guy just don't talk much. And then I watch him um, when he's in Oxford. And he still don't talk a lot, obviously. But I think he's got to be comfortable around people to be more open. But I will say this. I talked to him after a game last season. Um, it was shortly after we had had him on. So that's the reason I want to go down there and talk to him. He had two home runs in the game, guys. But he had an error in the game. And so the the guy looked like his dog died. And I was like, <laughs> Jacob, why you look upset? Y'all won and you hit two home runs. He's like, can't have errors, un- inexcusable. And I was like, that that says everything about him, man. He's he demands excellence. Yeah, absolutely. And that's what it takes. Good so, player, better kid. So y'all y'all kind of answered this. So if it, it's obviously the same answer, I'm, I'm I want a different one. Give me a different guy because I was going to ask. Uh, you know, when you pitch inner squads, who was the guy that was always the hardest and gave you the most trouble? So obviously, you kind of said that, Doug. All right, give me give me somebody else. Who was somebody who during inner squads you know you just didn't look forward to face because they kind of owned you. Well, I mean, I'm Tyler Keenan owned me my freshman year, but I had a daddy every single year. Don't get it twisted. And it was always a lefty. I don't get it why, but and this guy's gonna be so happy to hear this. I'm sure he'll be listening. It's Kevin Graham, man. My my junior year, the guy and he wouldn't like just rake me. He wouldn't be hitting doubles home runs. He would just work a walk out of me every time. Cause we'd go I cause I'd bring my A game every time he stepped in the box. He brought his best and he has and he would talk about it the, going into that fall. He's like, Doug, I just got contacts. Like, I'm going to hit 15 bombs this year, dude. Like, I don't, <laughs> I can see everything. I'm like, okay. So then it's fastballs, like fouling them off, fouling off curveballs, fouling off slider until he gets four balls and he walks first base. And we got to roll the inning because I threw 17 pitches to him. <laughs> so the guy just like saw me really well for some reason. Same thing Broadway was saying earlier. Like he just looked very comfortable off of me when every other person walking in there, I could carve him up, but he was just very comfortable in the box. So, so you, that's when you got to coach B and you say, when, when we're making these teams, if you could put Kevin Graham on my team, that'd be nice. <laughs> oh, well, Clem would make me face him every single time. Cause he would, Kevin would go back to him and be like, Doug hates face me. Keep putting me there, put me there. And he hit like three every time too. So I'd have to face him. What about you, Taylor? Who was that guy? Ooh, I think well, I think back to my first year, and, and Doug, Doug's gonna might remember this a little bit, but I, it was like my first inner squad, and so this guy, it's Cole Zabowski. Um, <laughs> it was like I think it was my first inner squad I pitched in, and I might have got behind two zero, and I threw a fastball to him, and I think he hit it four hundred and fifty feet, and <laughs> I don't think I got him out that whole year just it would be double in the gap it would be home run I think he had a couple home runs off of me so him from that year and then I think back I think back to maybe like even the COVID season and then 2021 COVID season I think I think back to Anthony Servideo he was on a different planet that year and (laughs) (laughs) yes not that you know not that that's you know some surprise just it was it was absurd and then also you know as you know that's you know the scrappy little guy he is Peyton Chatonier. I mean <laughs> I, I that I like is annoying like it's, it's annoying season. when he's in the box if we're gonna be honest you know the guy of you like I'm glad he's on my team and so that's yeah yeah, I feel like he's, uh, you know, uh, watching him out there the other day, I, I feel like he's in his, like, 10th season. You know, they I talked about how long Elko was there. I mean, I feel like Peyton's been there forever. <laughs> just so funny because funny, I remember when he came in being the young guy that just was, like, flowing with confidence, and now he's, like, the season season vet. Man, that makes me feel old, like, really, really old is when I can see Peyton Chatagnier become the season vet because he was, like, the young, spunky guy – first covid year like he was that he was that kind of character and now think about me i was like 23 when he came in yeah (laughs) the the cool part for and and i was old to him and now he's old to old miss the the cool part for old miss is for the third year in a row they're gonna have the best middle infield because jacob was too young to go in the draft and peyton seems to never gonna leave so like they get to (laughs) every pitcher feels great because they get to have them 
I gotta ask you guys. Speaking of, we're talking about a shot too, for sure. We're talking about inner squads. I don't know if either you guys. uh, I know y'all aren't all over social media, but I don't know if y'all saw the uh, the video. I put them all. I was I posted them all individually. Then I put them all together. But Taiwan Malone took three different pitcher uh, pitchers deep the other day, and none of the balls stayed in the ballpark. Even one was an oppo taco. Jump happened to see that. I saw like the one I saw was the four. The it went out of the ballpark. Yeah, whatever. Yeah. And so I was like, like, everybody asked me, who did he hit those off of? I was like, everybody on the team. I was like, nobody wants to pick them anymore. So he hit it up in that parking lot and left. Yeah. And then the, the only, so, yeah. I'm pretty sure the third one left the left the stand too. The the second one, the Apotaco, it stayed in. And then his fourth at bat, he hits a laser so hard off the center field fence that he actually, if you saw the video, he halfway to second, he had to turn around and come back because the ball bounced so hard off the wall and came back to the center fielder that he didn't even have time to get a double out of it. But, I mean, <laughs> this dude. Doug, I saw the, uh, you know, I follow the, like, Ole Miss baseball analytics page. Yeah. They always put the, like, top velos or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> it said top exit velos of the day. And I'm pretty sure they were all just Taiwan Malone. I think the one the, <laughs> one the center he laced was 117 off the bat, dude. Like, are you kidding me? <laughs> It's it was Aaron. just like, uh, or maybe one person was under his name, but all top four of the five were were Taiwan. Yeah. Guys. <laughs> and so I, I'm think I'm thinking he needs to not worry about football. I'm thinking he just needs to focus on baseball because he he's got something there clearly. It's like the demarcation line. If you can hit it up in that parking lot, that's like big, yeah. big, big boy territory. That's like Colby Bortles territory. That think back to like uh, Cockrell. Yeah, that's Chase Cockrell Chase territory. Cockrell. That's like you have dumb, dumb, dumb juice. Like Kemp can get it up there, I think. Kemp. Um, I've Is seen, there somebody? There's yeah. somebody else that we played with, too. Did, would Diller do it from the right side sometimes? I, I think occasionally he would give I, it a run, but I thought he had more pop from the three. He hit one, like, on top of that tree that's out there in left field one time in their squad. But I, yeah. but those are the only people. I think Cockrell and Kemp are the only people that I've seen actually put it in that parking lot on the fly. So Cockrell that's like, and BP was like a regular. Yeah, he'd hit them like halfway up the scoreboard, like five hundred mm-hmm. foot. I'll, I'll tell you a cool one. Last year was uh, so even though the game was out of hand, uh, Ben Joyce, you know, challenged Tim Elko, and he threw one hundred two, but he threw it right down the pipe, and Tim took it over the batter's eye, and I was like, that man just took one. You want to talk about the legend that continued, like, golly, this dude took 102 over the top. I was like, Phew. And it was, like I said, it was 10 – I think the score was 10-1, and that made it 10-3. So the game was out of hand, but I was like, if you're an old Miss fan that stuck around, like, you got to see something that was you're not going to see very often. So I've had teammates ask me about him – since I've been here and they've been like, do you think it's like, you think it's a little ridiculous that they're building a statue of him? And I'm every single time I said, no, if you, if you really dive into the story that he has, and you really like take a look at what he, what he went through and the example he sent, man, like he brought me to God with the type of stuff that he was doing. And it's just so, so, so Even the, our last year with the ACL, like see when he would hit home runs, I just couldn't help but like give him a hug when he'd come in the dugout. Yeah. Literally. So, so I mean, with that, Doug, one of the questions I had for later on, I'm just going to jump to it right now. I was going to ask you, what do you think should be implemented first? Doug Day is a national holiday or the Elko statue? But it sounds like you're all about the Elko statue. I think I, it's got to be him, man. I mean, he just is the essence of Ole Miss baseball, man. Like, he embodies everyone in that clubhouse, and he is. there's no better representation if you really want to put everybody into one person, it's him. I mean, he just phenomenal guy. I can't say enough good stuff about him. I can rant about him forever, but yeah. I mean, uh, the legends legend of, never die, right? right, right. People forget it's it did start when he was in high school. Uh, right. Has lived on and continues to live on. Well, when he came on his episode, like I told you guys with the with the other two old Miss guys, uh, one of the fan questions was, "What was his advice to Garrett Wood?" And it was it was so good and simple. He basically said, your teammates chose you to be in this role. 
So don't try to be someone that you're not. Be who you are because that's who they picked. And he said, then also remember, just because you wear the C on your chest doesn't mean you have to carry the whole load. You have other veteran teammates that are there, he says. So, you know, use them, um, bring them together as a team, help th help them become leaders. And I was just like, Tim was just sitting there doing it. And uh, and Randy was was with me and he was like, man, he was like, Everybody write that down. Take notes. That that's the words that you pass on. Tim Elko's just giving advice for everybody. I mean uh, the baseball world. No matter what he does in his life, he's gonna be successful. And I think that just goes to show the person he is and and just how well spoken he is. And he's just like, yeah, I think it's it's well I'm a deserved. personal fan of I'm a personal fan of Doug Day over the statue, even though Elko's been on our show twice. I look I look, I got excited. I'm an LSU guy, but like I got excited. Like it just it sounds so cool. It's Doug Day. Like, and then you know you knew what you were gonna get. Like you were gonna get in a casey like 110%. So but <laughs> but I got a question that that involves uh that involves both of y'all and two other guys, and one of them's Elko. So we have asked every Ole Miss guest this past season, guys, um, what did they like better, the Hunter Elliott hair flow or the Tim Elko stash? And so obviously, you know, Taylor, I seen at one point you grew one. Obviously, Doug, you got the hair flow. What do y'all think is – I'm going to start with you, Doug. You know, what's better? What's more important, to, to have the hair flow or to have that powerful stash? It, I mean, without a doubt, I think the stash carries more weight. Uh, I say that envious because I can't grow one. Uh, I can't like facial hair. This is actually you. You can't even tell, but this is the absolute max I got, and it's just a bunch of peach fuzz. But that's why the hair has to come, is because I got to be grizzled during the baseball season in some way. It's like a rite of passage. You got to have a big beard, solid mustache. But every person that I that I can see that can really rock a good stash, it, it says something. Brings a real presence to you when you're on the field. So. Uh, <laughs> Well, I'm surprised you. I'm surprised you didn't, you didn't say hair flow because, uh, first of all, Hunter, you know, obviously looked up to you, and that was one of his things. But he says all his power comes from his hair, and I, and I think about actually when you came on the end off the bench, you had told me that your hair was the shortest it had been in the time you were at Ole Miss, and Hunter refuses to get it cut because he thinks it'll take away, uh, you know, his pitching. So it's interesting. See, that's where I got to draw the line is uh, – You always do like a reset, don't you? I do a reset every like, – like, like, yeah. About two – like a month and a half ago, two months ago for me, I, I cut it like right around right, – either right before or right after Christmas. And that's why I cut my hair every single year, and I do once a year. But I got to have that reset. If I just let my hair go completely all the time, I look like a rug rat, man. But, like, but think, I, about, think about it from hundreds for something. Think about it from Hunter's perspective, all right? So in high school, um, for what he did at Tupelo, because he actually is just right down the road, so I actually watched him in high school and covered him and dominated in high school, and then he gets his freshman year. They win the national championship. He ends up becoming a weekend starter, ends up killing it, um, even in Omaha. Like, I don't, I wouldn't want to cut my hair either, man. I feel like it's some bad juju, but – uh, I don't know. You eat your own. Like you said, your hair may not be as clean as I know. I know I saw it the other day. You took a picture of my son. It's it's definitely getting down there, but it's the same answer for you, Taylor. I mean, you were trying to, I seen you, uh, I seen you had just a stash, but I, I think I'm looking at it right now. You got the beard in with it. I kind of, yeah, I kind of let it go, but I think my answer just cause I, in the sense of I can essentially grow the stash, but I can't grow the flow or at least have not given it a chance. I vote flow just cause I think, I mean, you look at the. There's some great ones out there. Obviously, you know, everyone loves like Dansby Swanson's flow. I mean, it's it's a good look with a ball cap on. And I mean, I wish that I could do that. And then and then there's the guys that both. We actually, you know, we do our end of the season awards and off the bench, and uh, we did the who who has best uh, hair flow or uh, beard game. And Hunter Holland, um, the pitcher for Arkansas, actually won, and he's got both. So what a jerk, man! He's got both. Guys are just trying to have one or the other. He, you know, he's he's got both know. of them. Some but that, people just all, oh, but that guy's got it all, man. Good for him. <laughs> yeah. But yeah. but speaking of what a transition, because talking about a guy from Arkansas, a hot topic, and being that we got guys that are that are neutral in this situation, one of the biggest trending debates um, when it comes to SEC baseball is what is a better stadium, Duty Noble or Baum Walker? So Taylor, I'll let you go first this time. What's the better stadium? 
Wow. <laughs> put, put, put your feelings aside for the team. I just want to know straight up, what is the better stadium? I'd rather play in a dog park than go back to either of those places. <laughs> that, that's not the question. You got to answer. <laughs> but, hey, that's you're supposed to. Your SEC best right. rivals. Let me go. Granted, we played – four times I believe in 2019 and I didn't pitch once out there all right so I got to watch a lot of baseball <laughs> from the <laughs> dugout and got to watch Doug uh pitch a hell of a game in super regionals um so no we didn't play four times it was six times because three game series and three game super regional and I'm gonna tell you what that was I mean obviously they're both great atmospheres but something about Bomb Walker to me felt like a next, like a next level, like the next level of like almost a professional stadium mm -hmm. to me. Duty Noble, I mean, great. You know, they have, they have everything. Um, <laughs> but in that sense, that year, like the, the one thing I hate the most though is the calling the hogs. We can, I'm sorry, <laughs> I'm just going to say that right now. Um, that we heard that's, it quite a bit. That's not even close, because Taylor, that's like in my head, and you know, I'll I'll listen to Colin Baton Rouge sometimes if I'm in that kind of mood. It, but that, like calling the Hogs is like it's the word. It's like cyanide. I hate. I, like it's poison. I can't. Luke Lipsius from oh. Tennessee. Uh, you know, and obviously he had a long. He had a six year career. Uh, he was recently on, and he said the same thing. He said, "I just I can't do." He said that was why he he picked Duty Noble. He's like, I can't do Baum Walker, man. He's like, I can't do the call. That hogs. hog pin, they had that hog pin full, like for I mean for our BP, and <laughs> if you were in left so, field for BP, you were getting, you were you were you were done. Every here, game in the book. But here, uh, here I'll put it to you this way. I so I have. What's I your happen. answer? Yeah. I mean, I totally agree with you. Bomb Walker has that special feel where it feels like you're playing at a big league spot. Like it feels professional. It's green. It's like something about the green seats. I think I, that sounds stupid, but it kind of feels like Fenway in that way. A little on, it's like the... built all the way around. Yeah, right, and it's right, just right. like you are. It's got that feel where it's like, wow, I, it feels pretty big time there, and that's cool. Uh, but screw those people. I'm not giving them the award. Um, I'm going <laughs> to give Duty Noble. Uh, because you know, I feel good on that mound, and I do think that it is like the epitome of college baseball. I think now that they don't have like the cars backed up back there and everything, that it, it's a little bit different that way. But I just think that they the just, whole tailgating essence, basically. Yeah, they got it. They yeah. got it. It's college baseball at its finest, for the exception of Swayze. Swayze is college baseball at its finest. So. <laughs> A little, dude a, little bi a little bias there, a little here, Doug. Yeah. So, so Absolutely. I'll tell you what's not getting considered in best stadium, but um, unanimously, a lot of players are telling us as far as atmosphere, and it's not. It's I guess it's kind of complimentary, but it's kind of not. They say playing at Bluebell in Texas A and M is man. They say it's huh, It's tough. Like the the crowd, especially on you pitchers, is is something. So I'm from. Texas, Houston, Texas, about 45 minutes from College Station. And truly, that's where my dad went to school, and that's where I wanted to go play. So, sadly, I was really looking forward to that when we played there my in 2021. But that year, I didn't really get a full taste of it because they still, even though it was later in the year, their university still had restrictions on attendance. As we were starting to slowly kind of progress – they still had a restriction on attendance, and it was nowhere. I don't know if you remember, Doug, but I remember because I was really looking forward to just the atmosphere of Blue Belt. Now it's one of the nicest, like, fields in general. They do a great job with the field crew, but just didn't really get the, the best experience getting together, and that was probably the one place I really looked forward to getting back to, you know, going. Yeah, no doubt. Yeah. So Well, also, what's-his-name was just dominating us that week, and so that made it worse, too. Uh, I mean, Will we, Frizzell. Yeah, Will Frizzell haunts my dreams still, man. That, I mean, what is That's that? Funny. 
Is he playing professional Definitely. baseball? Do you know, Taylor? Uh, yes, he is. I believe he's with the Nationals. Good for him. He is a phenomenal hitter, and I'll just leave it at that, man. Maybe right. there's always an A&M guy, because I was at the Ole Miss A&M series last year in Swayze, and Dylan Rock came in and had a had a field day. And so, and so, but i tell you what, you know, uh, for all the heat that, like, Tennessee took for their antics last year, Dylan Rock came into Swayze, and that dude launched his bat both times and, like, strutted and, like, started taunting the crowd, and I thought – and and nobody said anything about it, and I thought, why? Because he don't play for Tennessee. I was like, this. I was like, I wasn't a fan. Like, I, I don't even mind some of the antics, but like, I don't know. He was a little too much for me. I didn't watch that, but there is a there's mm-hmm. a line you got to walk, and I think that like your coach, uh, in a way, kind of sets that precedent of what's okay and what's not, whether he verbalizes it or not. He the way. So, I mean, I think Tony and everything they do at Tennessee is phenomenal. And But he lets them play, and good for him, because he gets the best out of them in that way. But, like, I, I agree with you, too. Like, they, they're a little bit much for well, me. And, 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 Luke, and Luke talked about that. As Luke a pitcher, talk, too. Luke talked about how much he enjoyed having fun and, and the stuff that he felt was okay. And he, he even called out his teammate, you know, talking about Jordan Beck and talking about – you know, middle fingers are too much, and he's talking about Gilbert. Uh, you know, cussing out the umpire. He's like, you know, there's there's drawing a line, but he's like, you know, the bat flips, checking the bat, you know, all that kind of They're stuff. Like the bad boys of baseball, huh? Yeah, yeah. Well, no. I, it'll be interesting to see because obviously, like Doug said, they take on Tony V's personality, but a lot of the guys who were the bad boys are gone. Yeah. Well, the only reason I, I feel like I would probably be way more open to it, but as a pitcher, I probably did as much as you could do. <laughs> as far as like well, I mean, I, I I felt like I did. I we both like we shared our emotions. Yeah. But, Taylor, did but you ever draw? Did you ever draw a circle with a K in the mound like Doug told me he used to do in high school? That's what I need. Mean. He said he'd strike somebody out and then draw a K K in the dirt. You remember that, Doug? That. <laughs> yeah, back in high school. That, but that was when I was I was getting drummed and I was a young buck. I was an idiot. But I mean, most of it, I feel like our energy, Taylor, was always directed at our, at our teammates, and that's the I difference. Say that. Who are yeah. who are you screaming at? Are you screaming in like elation of happiness, or are you screaming at the other team because you know f those guys? That I think that's the difference. And truly, yeah. that was one thing that, like, one I you know. I think it came more so from Coach Laugh, our pitching coach, and that is just like he wants you to be a bulldog, and he want you know he wants guys that are gonna go out there and, and you know essentially let their nuts hang and 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 play. <laughs> well, and, it shows turning that switch on and off, Taylor, because talk, anytime I've ever talked to y'all, y'all are the calmest guys. But you know, I got so many video clips. Everybody's seen them of y'all. Like what you said, you you strike out, get out of a big inning or whatever the case, and y'all are just like amped. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but and I think that also helps, like you know, just and and as well as like going down the line from top to bottom of, of your teammates, and and we just that's how we expressed ourselves, and and some guys might go about it differently, but like Doug said, I feel like it was always towards each other, or or I mean, towards like our our bench, essentially, is, is how you could say it, right. So the last one I got for the foes question, it, it's a hard one because like I need you to put like who you want or your friendship side, but who you think. And so, Doug, I'll come back to you first. Taking the two of you out of the equation of your former teammates that are not already called up, if they are, who do you think is the next guy to make it to the show? Mm, dude, that is not playing pro baseball currently. It is not there already. Who's going to be the oh. next guy? Well, no, wait. So they could be in the minors, yes? Right, yeah, minors. Where, hey, oh. if, you, if you think Jacob Gonzalez is going to walk right in. <laughs> I mean, sure, dude, he might. I But I think the next one up for us is probably Rolo. I think Rolo is going to be the next one up. Yeah, but we didn't play with him. Oh, well, yeah. yeah you, somebody that. you played with. Right? Like, oh. I'm trying to. Oh, well, Kessinger. It's got to be Cat. It's got to be Gray. I think Gray would probably be the next one up for me. Shoot, I hope everyone makes it. But I do think Gray's probably got the best shot to be there this next year. If if I'm gonna be You can't pick four to strike. I'm no, I'm gonna I'm gonna go for it and it's gonna be and I think he's I think it's a he's got a very good chance and I hope I haven't talked to him in a while and I hope he's bouncing back well. 
but Gunnar Hoglund. Yeah. Oh, that's so true. That's a good pick. Gunnar Hoglund. Gunnar, uh, so, I mean, what about uh, this? Is- I got I got a I, I got a prep for my next episode. Uh, but uh, any any guess that we have on friends or foes is a is a previous guess of it off the bench. But we're actually making an adjustment one time, um, because uh, we were going to get him in off the bench, but we're like booked for three months. So we're actually bringing on Wyatt Short to come on with Dallas Wolfolk. Um, isn't I haven't done my research on him yet, but isn't he like up in AAA? He is. He is. Yeah. So he's a potential candidate he's with the Cubs. Yeah, but I mean, like we didn't. He's he was a few years before us, but I've oh I've, y'all didn't pitch with him. To, no, no, he's a few years because he's a few years. I believe those 2017, 2018 guys. There, it's their time. I think a lot of guys, a lot of big debuts. I think are coming around the corner for them dudes. Right. But right. for the guys that we played with, though, that's where it gets tough. Because dude, Gunner, I like you said, man, he. Um, and I, I think he's going to get the. He's going to get a <laughs> shot. He's with the A's, right? Yeah, he could be in the big leagues tomorrow, man, with the stuff that he had and the control that he had. Like, he reminds me a lot of a guy we have in our organization that, like, has the stuff, like, maybe could th- maybe could throw him on our harder for a righty starter. But, like, you just take the pure being able to do this, just back and forth, in and out, up and down. Like, he can do it all. So, that's a good pick, Tanner. So, yeah. so I want to skip ahead to a fan question then because we're talking about this already. One of the fans asked – um, do you feel like, you know, and, and Taylor, I'll start with you. Like, do you feel like if Gunner doesn't get hurt, we could be talking about Ole Miss back-to-back national champions? 100%. I mean, I think it's a fair assessment. I know people say, you know, injury is part of the game, and they are. Like, it, it, it is. But, like, I mean, when you lose a guy of that caliber from your rotation, it's a big deal. Doug, you feel the same way? I'd be lying to say I didn't like it. Didn't haunt me for about a month or two. If I'm be honest, well, like, I, you would talk to me. I I was in the dumps. Yeah, I, I and mean, sadly, it, it's like I mean, I felt like it was all. I mean, I I, I pitched, yeah. started game three, and it's. I mean, it, yeah, truthfully, it's not all on me, but you know, mm-hmm. essentially, did not go my way game three, and yeah, it's. I mean, it haunted me too. No, because I mean, I look back at it and. You know, I look back at the that game, not that game, but even just like that weekend in A and M. We didn't even talk about that. Will Frizzell may have had a weekend in A and M, but that was the weekend we lost Gunner. And like, I think we never lost hope. And I put a lot of credit to the guys in our in our locker room and our dugout. Like, we never lost hope. But for a lot of people, that might have just been it right there. You know, yeah. I mean, we made it further than a lot of people probably thought we would. Once Absolutely. The season piecing, has, piecing things together. Oh, and, and y'all were playing a, a great Arizona team in their house. I mean, that that's a tough draw within itself. And then, you know, you're missing one of your your key guys. Yeah. I think that it just haunts me because you look at what the 20 is. Taylor, I'll, I'll say this, man. I, I know how you, you, you may have felt some kind of way, but I didn't see anybody say anything negative, and they were proud of you for going out there to do the best job you can. Like Doug said, like, your, your job has always been to come down there and shut it down. Get the three outs, the six outs, or whatever. So I mean, you know, yeah, you and go I, out there I and wouldn't do, what you do it could. any other way. I told Coach B like the night. I think it was the night before or something. I want the ball, and ultimately yep. gave and me the ball. Single, and I, every single one of us wanted him to have the ball too, right? So like that. That's just the the way the the way the ball like lands. You know, it's just how it happens. But I. The only thing that haunts me about that season is I look is once the 2022 season happens, you see how hot that team got. They're mm-hmm. they're a three seed. Like we were still a regional host, and we were right. we weren't quite down bad as the 2023 team was by the end of the regular season, but we weren't in a good spot. Like we could have been a national seed if we win a couple more weekends down the stretch in 2021, but we weren't, and you know. Take it doesn't even necessarily take Gunner being there in that game three of Arizona. It may just take us winning a few more games in the regular season to be a national seed to have that Put us in a better spot. Right. Right. Well, I, I'll tell you guys, I was at the turning point. I was I was at Alex Box, you know, as an LSU fan for the Ole Miss series, and and Dylan Delusia came on and talked about it. It was interesting. Uh, he pitched forty pitches the uh, the Friday night, and then it got rained out. Um, and he begged Coach B to let him pitch on Saturday. And the reason he did was in their scouting uh, report meeting, 
they were specifically told not to throw down the middle in any way, shape, or form to Dylan Cruz, and he did and gave up a uh, gave up a bomb in the first inning as a leadoff. And so um, he was st- he said he was still steaming about that, and he wanted to go back out there. And so he goes back out there the next day, absolutely shoves Hunter shoves the the. So obviously domination from the pitching staff, and then the batting lineup just tees off on LSU pitching and. And I went down there and I was like, golly, man, I'm glad I drove to Baton Rouge, you know, because I'm a season ticket holder, Ole Miss. I was like, I've been going to games and hadn't seen anything like this. I come to watch y'all against my team and y'all just going to put it all together. <laughs> but that was when it happened. Like they go in, they go into Alex Box and, and sweep them and do it in such a fashion. And then after that, they were rolling. So it's crazy how just that one weekend, like everything can click and come together and just turn the team around. Yeah, all well, it takes. For our teams, it always seemed like it was the SEC tournament where we'd flip it around. But uh, for them, it was at least still in the regular season, which is probably a little yeah, bit more. Yeah, they, they, got, they got plunked first game SEC tournament. Right, and they yeah. didn't. They, a lot of them said they came on and said they didn't think they were going to get in, and once they did, it's like playing with house money. You never thought you were going to be in. So it's, 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 the pressure is actually off now. Like, go out there and have fun. It's a lot Whereas, like, like, I think with some years with – I mean, personally, Doug, with us, was like, pressure was. I mean, it's a little bit of that pressure was there. It was just like get to Omaha. I think those guys just truly took it in. Like, we have a, we got a chance that we didn't think we were gonna have. Let's go see what happens. You know? Yeah, yeah. And I, and I, I, I was a little blessed in that way where, like, I just. I had people around, like when Mike Clement came up to me and it's just like, what an awesome coach and human being, just a MVP in the game of life. Like he truly is. But anyways, when he comes up to me before that super regional and tells me, we just got to figure out how to win one game. Cause I know we're going to win the day you pitch. Like then that weight was taken off of me because of the words he told me, but I know probably for other guys in that dugout, they were feeling it, but like, that was some of the magic, I guess, of Ole Miss with Doug Day and that whole hysteria because I didn't really ever – that really – all that pressure really bounced off me because of the great people around me and the words that they said. Yeah, but I, I just think for like uh, – you know, me me and you talked a lot while we were there and I was just like the one I felt for one, for me and you being the, the years that we were in, your what was your third year, right, your junior year – um <laughs> And, you know, that was just, for one, it was one thing we wanted to do for ourselves so badly, but it was also one thing we wanted to do for Coach B yeah. as well, the, you know. Whether we wanted to do it for ourselves. Right. And so I, I wouldn't say, like, it's still the game of baseball, but we it's just something we badly wanted to do, and, you mm-hmm. know. Not that that's a bad thing. But, hey, old, but ultimately you didn't get the national chip. Go ahead, Doug. I was just going to say, sometimes you just got to, like, like yeah, we never had a direct like effect on that stuff, but you know, setting the foreground and maybe like getting things to their event horizon where it's stuff's gotta like it's push or it's like crap or get off the pot type situations. Mm-hmm. Maybe what we there to do is kind of push to that kind of event horizon, you know. Right. Yeah, no, whether it's been the state guys or the old miss guys, they've absolutely said the guys who came before them, you know set it up you know y'all are a part of building that program to what it was and the guys even before you that y'all were mentioning so don't get it twisted you 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 played a role and we talked about the iron sharpens iron thing y'all help make those guys better for for that upcoming season no doubt like i said no matter what i mean and that's that's something they reiterated i'm sure to both of us was just like you know we and and gunner as well it's like we laid that foundation and and allowed them to to you know help a uh, helping hand into, into a little bit into what they were able to do yeah no doubt so let's get into these fan questions and you know um obviously that man i'm sure you're gonna have to go through a lot but doug man what was your favorite moment in swayze in your career oh gosh um oh there's a lot of good ones that come to mind i it's I don't – I'm not going to go straight to the 16K performance because that, that's, like, my – maybe the biggest on-stage things. And there's a lot of moments that I had on the field that people will look back and say, that's the best one, that's the best one, what, yada, yada, yada. I think some of the – my I, it's so cheesy. Like, yeah, on-field moments, there was a lot that happened. 
I think my favorite moment of being an Ole Miss Rebel was I was at, walking out for a random practice, and this is just the environment that Coach B has created there that's phenomenal. I walked out there for a day of practice, and, um, you know, our uh, what my roommate and our uh, player assistant, J.R. Swam, is out there shooting fly balls to the outfielders. And um, Coach Mark McMillan uh, was out there in the outfield, and he's yelling at J.R. to um, bring him out a bucket. JR can't hear him and he keeps like, what are you saying? What are you saying? I, and I just looked at him, messed with him. I said, he's told you to shoot another ball through there, man. So he shoots a ball through the machine and everyone in the outfield like scrambles and Mark just, uh, Coach Mack just comes in and lights this kid up, like lights JR up. And um, it's probably my favorite moment because I, I <laughs> set, set somebody up for failure. Wow. I, but that's just like messing around like day to day stuff. I, I don't think like the success was a result of like all the fun and hard work that we did. But like those were the days that were my absolute favorite. Like what puts a smile on my face when I think back about it, it's not like punching 16 dudes out. It's like sitting there and like those moments of laughing and. You're, yeah. you're a rare bird, Doug, because most people would say it'd be having 16 punches, dude. I'm about to say, that's <laughs> a very professional question or answer out of you there, Doug. <laughs> Taylor, what's yours? What's it? I think back, I guess it's very fresh, but is how crazy it was. But in accumulation, this is of a whole, I think – this is going to be based off of, you know, an actual game. And it is when we won the regional or in 2021, when we played Southern Miss on the Monday, right after we we really expected to win Sunday. And I remember coming home Sunday, me and Doug lived together. And, um, you know, we lived with JR as well, who he we just mentioned. Um, and we came home that day, that night, I believe, after getting plunked, I mean, just embarrassed on Sunday when we so Southern Miss has to beat us twice because we're in the driver's seat um and we come and we have this little kitchen table and we just sit down and I remember we were sitting across from each other and we just look at each other and I, I don't remember who asked who said it but we we're just like what just happened <laughs> But then as well as like a whole like swing of emotions too, because you go from, we were like, we're, you know, we're not going to lose this to me and Doug are looking at each other and like, well, we're not now it's like Monday could be our last, our last game together, you know, like, yeah, this and is we a, looked this, at each other like, and we, we said, were not, we were never anticipating because all our head was Omaha and we were not expecting that, that because it just hit us like a, a ton of bricks were like holy crap our last game in an almost uniform could be tomorrow like for that arizona game we fully were like this could be it you know i guess just because of the whole omaha curse and everything we kind of we you, you had that feeling but like that game we we're like holy crap this could actually be it right and so then we sit down and we sit down i remember me and you both were like one you had just thrown however many pitches against florida state that that time i think i had thrown I threw against Florida State as well, but you had thrown well, you know, well, way more than I had. Like and, oh, <laughs> and we just both, you know, both were basically like, we're going to do whatever it takes for this to not be our last game in an Ole Miss uniform. And that was just cool. I remember people. going to bed. Right. And I remember going to bed and I'm just like, I, you know, I just was like, I'm not letting, we can't let this happen. And, you know, I can only, we can only control, you know, so much, obviously. But, um, and then going out Monday and, and ultimately, as that game was bizarre, by the way. I mean, it's, it rains and Elko hits a grand slam in the rain. I remember, <laughs> um, Elko I with a big two. moment. No way. <laughs> yeah. Hit, we're up like, five in the seventh or eighth and they hit like three bombs in a row off of me <laughs> was it three off of you no i so two, i came two, in two. so what happened was is somebody was out on the mound and they left the bases chucked with two outs so i came in i got a punch to get out of that inning and then coach b asked me if i wanted to roll back out there and i was like yeah sure so i get two quick outs 
the and then I get O2 or one two and everyone's on and they're doing their clap thing and here we go. I spin a curveball, bang, homer. <laughs> it gets cut to four. And then okay, we get another two strikes. Everyone starts clapping. Slider, bang, homer. Now it's three. And then you come in. Then I yeah, then I came in, but just for one, just after I think it went to show, like I was very proud of just everybody because of how bad we got plunked on Sunday and how bad Monday could have gone too, because I think we jumped out to a huge lead. Then they came back. Then we jumped out to a huge lead again. They came, whatever. And yeah. just winning that game and, and that Monday was just how crazy it was. It was yeah, Doug, one of I my think to favorite your, moments. Doug, to speak to your point about the Arizona versus at home thing, like, you know, and, and Taylor talking about that being y'all's final game at home, like, it's no fun way to lose, but you sure don't want to lose at your last home game, you know, in front of your home crowd, right? Like, it's, it's a little bit easier to lose on the road for your final game than it would have been in front of your fans. Right. Yeah. Especially at hosting a region. Wait, too. no, you actually ended up rolling out there for the eighth because I, I, I almost put out some false information. My last pitch I threw at Swayze was not a home run. I did punt. <laughs> I, he did let me get a final pitch after that, and I let I did get a punch. Doug's Do, got to make sure that he knows that everybody – he didn't go out on a home run. Then I got – okay, and then I got – Getting yanked yeah. after a ball. <laughs> yeah. So, so Doug, yeah. a question. But the 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 bases loaded strikeout was uh that was that was unreal. I remember that. Was, that. that was a good. One. Yeah. So, uh, a question that uh, fans have had, you know, seeing that Delusha, you know, transferred in after you had left Doug, but he gets drafted into the uh, same organization. Um, have you had any contact with him? Have y'all worked together in any way, shape, or form? Uh, I see Lu- I see Big Loosh every single day up here at the facility, and it's a pleasure to work with them. Uh, he's an awesome character, and he's like just a really good guy uh, from what I've met. I haven't, I haven't known him for very long, so I've, I really actually only know him as a Cleveland Guardian, and I only have no uh, Dylan uh, as an Ole Miss Rebel for what I've seen on video. I have never watched him play in a Rebels uniform, so I really only know him for what he is now which is a really good kid and a hard worker. So I see him in the facility a lot. And, um, you know, it's a pleasure. I, yeah. I, I haven't had a lot of time to, like, really bro down with them. But um, well, if, you do, if you do, be careful. I spent three days in Atlanta with him, uh, set up some NIL stuff, and, and I took him and, and Josh Hatcher and Dylan Ross from Georgia and, and a couple other guys. And, boy, Delusha kept me on – man on my toes because like i couldn't have anybody get in trouble while i got them there for a trip and he was going to make sure that i stayed out all hours of the night and make sure he didn't get in trouble so if you do decide <laughs> that you're going to hang out with him outside of the baseball field be careful <laughs> I, will. I will and i'm not telling you a secret because the guy that was one of the things that uh brandon johnson and uh tim were, were razzing him about him apparently everybody knows dylan's uh way so you gotta you gotta keep uh dylan on the path but when he's focused and he's on that mound uh man he's a dude for sure yeah stunned. so you know taylor i gotta ask man I, a lot of people have asked this and when i and, and when i looked at the pictures of you like i see it like how often do you get told you look like chris pratt actually very often <laughs> that's funny you say that i do and you know what? I own it too, cause I like it. Dude, you're a guardian you know? of the galaxy, bro. Absolutely. I'm a huge Marvel fan now. I think Doug might. I don't know if Doug might know this, but <laughs> uh, my girlfriend and uh, her best friend got me into Marvel, and uh, and Guardians is probably one of the best best movies there is. But I, that's actually funny you say that, cause I've been in. I've been to a couple like grocery stores. And I don't know why it's in the grocery stores where the the um the people check it like doing scanning my you know groceries and stuff and said you look like chris pratt so yeah it's very uh, nice. yeah no, so, i haven't looked at that so i gotta give that a look well and, and yeah. speaking of look alike obviously you don't look like in the face but uh one of the things people have talked about and want to know is doug like what's it like seeing you know a long-haired blonde lefty wearing number 26 pitch from the mound like <laughs> i mean like is it, is it cool? Does it feel weird? Like, what's that like? Well, I got a couple different alter egos. You guys you guys may not know this, but there's another part of me uh, that I like to go play for the Jacksonville Jaguars every once in a while and go <laughs> sling the rock there. Uh, but then also my other alter ego is I like to act like I'm younger and I go out and play for the Rebels when I'm too old to play for the Rebels anymore. 
Uh, I'll no. tell you what. Yeah, that first weekend I saw him, like I watched them play, and he pitched to, I don't remember when it was, but, and just from the back, like I saw, you know, how the TV camera is, I saw it from the back, and it was just kind of like it's, a second take. I'm like, wait, what? And it was funny <laughs> because he came, he came on the show, and so, man, Doug, just if you didn't know, he picked that number specifically because you were his guy, like – He's an old uh, old Miss fan, um, you know, coming up, cool. and obviously, even though he's only a few years younger than you, um, and being that he was a lefty with the long blonde hair, he wanted he wanted to rock the twenty six. But I'll tell y'all an interesting note of talking about picking a number. We just had Grayson Sonier, the pitcher on, um, the freshman pitcher, and uh, I'm watching the pizza bowl with Dylan Delucia. We're sitting there watching it, and he takes the mound and he goes, "Man, that is the most awkward thing in the world seeing twenty five toe the rubber." And so we have Grayson on, and I asked him why he picked that number. And, guys, I'm going to be honest with you. I don't know how somebody goes to Ole Miss and doesn't know this, but he picked 25 and did not realize that was Elko's number. And I said, you realize, <laughs> buddy, you got, you know, you got big shoes that you're wearing now. Like, you're wearing 25, you better bring it. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, that number there's... might not be available too much longer, <laughs> huh? Yeah. I was surprised they let a freshman just come in and have it like that. Like, I feel like you have to have some sort of status already, right, if you go wear <laughs> Tim's number. But I'll tell you guys this. Uh, no, no joke. Watch him in the fall. Watch to, he, he just got two innings in the other day, that same game with Taiwan Malone. Um, had four punches. Uh, looked, looked awesome. I mean, blew right by Alderman. Like, uh, he looked good. And, by the way, on an Alderman note, I'm glad that neither of y'all's favorite moment at Swayze was my uh, – I'm not gonna say it was my least favorite because it was actually kind of cool um, <laughs> as, as a baseball fan. But that nine to one blown lead where Alderman walks it off, um, <laughs> that hurt. But I also told somebody like I was like from a baseball fan to see the the Swayze showers on a walk off is is something you won't see anywhere else in America. And so I like I had to appreciate it for what it was. But it stung especially because I was supposed to meet up with the LSU guys afterward and like. Uh, below so and then we're running by me and they're like we gotta get like they said we gotta get our ass and dug out now like and so <laughs> <laughs> d- didn't get to talk to them yeah. didn't get to enjoy it but y'all y'all came back the man talk about just overcoming adversity and never giving up that was that was a heck of a game we needed that one. that was no. the wildest i think yeah. it was nine to one and all of a sudden, it got to nine to six or something. it was mccann it was mccann <laughs> coach B told me yeah and Coach B just told me, get to the bullpen now and start <laughs> throwing in case anything happens. And then, like, we obviously tie it or whatever, and I had to rapid fire on the mound. I just – was... <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Once once McCants – I think McCants hit a grand slam that made it 9-8. Yeah, I, like, I can't remember just off the top of my head. And that once ball that got, going unbelievable. Yeah, and so once that happened, I was like, holy crap, LSU's fixing to lose this game. Like, it's they still had a lead, and I already felt it. Like, I was like, this is going to happen. <laughs> And then I wasn't very familiar with Alderman and, and, you know, Leatherwood's my boy. And so he's pinch hitting for, for Leatherwood. And I'm kind of like, oh, what's up, man? They're taking my boy Hayden out. And then Alderman just smokes it. And I'm like, okay, Coach. First B, pitch, what too, yeah, Knows what he's doing. Like, okay, you know, don't ever question the coach. But, Thanks. man, I got to ask you guys about something. Uh, those were the fan questions. I have my own personal questions just from following y'all. Um, uh, Starting with you, Taylor, man, I want to ask you, man, you're – your big brother, man. You're. Uh, I watch you share the stuff. How supportive you are of Dylan, man. Talk to me about how Dylan's doing. Talk to me about what it's been like being able to go and support him when you can. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, like I posted on Instagram recently, but I got to go see him play, and I'm not. You know, like I said, it's not. I don't get to see him go. <laughs> don't get to see him play very much anymore. Just um, with how crazy my baseball career and my life is at, at this point, but. Um, just really cool to see see what he's doing. I mean, I'm glad, you know, he's he's writing his own story and I'm glad he, you know, he's doing that and that he's very passionate about baseball and loves the game and um he actually went to the same TCS postgrad program as I did um last season or last year um after his after he graduated high school and um now he's off to a junior college in, in West Texas called Cisco and a really good program and I mean just what if he just proud, follows super, your super route all the way? Like, what if y'all both just accomplish this amazing <laughs> feat, right? Like, I mean, it, that's that's the plan. I mean, he he wants to go to um, 
Ole Miss, ultimately. You'll actually probably like to hear this. He he wants to go to LSU, too. I mean, he's yeah. got aspirations to go there. Um, but, no, yeah, I mean, I'm just telling him just to, you know, put his head down, focus, and and just, you know, do what he can do and, and, and be him. I mean, you know, whatever happens, happens. You don't have to follow my footsteps at the same time. You know, you can, you know, you, you can you've do your own great thing. Example. I don't, correct, correct. I don't want him to feel like he's, you know, following – you know, some shadow or, or anything like that. And I'm glad he's kind of created his own path. And um, I hope to, you know, hope nothing but the best for him. I'm going to support and watch him as much as I can. And um, hopefully he can, you know, get him get him a nice scholarship at, a D, at the D, D1 level. Yeah, no doubt. And so for you, Doug, man, I was able to share when you shared it. Um, you know, when I talk about growing the game, when I talk about getting athlete stories, anytime I see anything – um, from an engagement to a baptism, you know, having a baby, whatever. I share that stuff. And when I shared your baptism into the Swayze Crazy Group, it literally got like over a thousand likes and a hundred comments. It's kind of funny that they they always comment because they're commenting to my post, like Doug, like Doug posted it. So like Doug's going to see everybody, <laughs> they're posing questions or congratulating, but it, it's still cool. And so, man, I shared that for a reason, Doug, like I said, I celebrate everybody's thing, but you know, I got baptized myself last year. And so, um, you know, just talk to me, Doug, for one, how special was it? And two, the question that was most commonly asked was like, did you go home for that? Or was that like where you were at playing baseball? Um, no, it, it was just an unbelievable moment. I'll touch on this first, the second part first, which was I have a church back home, uh, the Crossings Church, and it's my my neighbor, my next door neighbor. We actually share a wall because I live in a town home back home. Uh, his name's uh, Marcio Pacheco, and he's my lead pastor at the Crossings. And he uh, has been praying for me pretty much my whole, more than I've ever known, uh, for me to come to Christ. But I never, I wasn't really open to any of that, I guess, throughout my whole college career. And then um, either way, man, I had a couple moments during my first pro career that brought me towards brought me to God and I went home and had this great experience and they it was actually back home where uh at, at the church in Winter Garden where I'm from where he told he uh I got baptized and everything so um it was an unbelievable moment and I was I felt like it was a long time coming um I know everyone has different journeys um getting to where they're at and everything but um you know, it's really a combination of uh, fantastic teammates, brothers along the way that have just like prayed for me and, you know, <clears throat> known that, I mean, they, they had the end goal in mind, right? Mm -hmm. Which was to glorify God in any way that we can and to just eventually get me there. And so we could become brothers in God, not, I guess they knew what I needed in every moment. So, and they knew that God was going to get me there eventually. So um, I don't even mean to ramble on too much about it, but uh, it was no man. It's a, it's an exciting moment, and that's why I shared it. Yeah, I mean, it's the happiest moment of my life. So, um, it was awesome. Yeah, what made was, made made the off season one to remember. What was cool was awesome. I was able to share. Brandon Johnson got engaged the same day that that you got baptized, and so y'all yeah. both posted, and I was like, and I shared. It, I was like, man, and and that's the thing. That's cool because we talk about the fan base and that, and they love y'all and. Uh, they want to share these victories with y'all. So it, it's, it really just speaks more volumes to, to how much they love and support y'all. And, and when they see these things, man, they get excited because y'all are family, man. And so it, it's really cool stuff. And so, you know, congratulations on that. And, you know, um, Taylor, man, on your brother, I'm telling you, 30 for 30 one day. It's happening, both y'all. <laughs> But, man, I've, I've kept you guys on here long enough, man. But we look forward to seeing you guys, uh, what y'all do in the future. For those listening, um, you know, you can follow Doug at Doug DeCasey. It's very simple. All you got to do is spell his name on Instagram or for Taylor. It's Taylor underscore Broadway 07. But, man, guys, I just thank you for your time and uh, wish you the, the best of luck in the future, man. Both amazing, amazing young men with amazing talent. And uh, I appreciate y'all uh, coming on here. Absolutely. Thank you for having me again. Yeah, no problem. Y'all have a good night. You too.